So over a month ago, our whole family had strep and I actually lost my voice. So I barely got it back last week before I was like, eh. but yeah, anyways. So yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, thank you guys so much for having us and thank you for the love, the hospitality and the generosity that you've, you've shown us so far. So scriptural authority, right? Probably really familiar with this concept and you know, maybe you've heard a lot of lessons on it, maybe you've talked about it a lot, because it's important. Without scriptural authority, everything falls apart, right? Without understanding that the final authority is the Bible itself, everything falls apart. And why is that? Because anybody can say, I think this, I think that. Anybody can say, I feel this, I feel that. Anybody can say, the Holy Spirit fell upon me and gave me this vision and this dream, right? The Holy Spirit fell upon me, gave me this prophecy, and this is what this means. And we've even had super common religions that are rampant in this world and say that this guy hears from God and everybody has to listen to him, and he's the authority, even above the scriptures, you see. You guys probably know exactly who I'm talking about. Uh, but yeah, let's talk about this. All right. <laughs> Actually, I want to, is there a laser pointer on here? This, this green, the green one? Yeah, green, nice. All right, so check this out. Let's simplify this, authority. So what's the first six letters spell in this, in this word? Author, that's right, you see? From the original source, the original designer, the original writer of history. It's God that writes the pen, what's history? Split up the word, his story, right? His story, he's the one that writes everything. He's sovereign, he's in control of everything. He's the author. And we will look at from the original source, from the original stuff, look what he calls himself in the Bible, right? Acts 3.15, author of life, author of peace, author of salvation, author and finisher of our faith. You see that? He's the author. And you know who I'm talking about? It's Jesus, right? But I'm going to make that absolutely clear. So Strong's uses the word authority and talks about the jurisdiction. We're under the jurisdiction of God, the jurisdiction of Jesus Christ himself. And we see that from Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, if you'd like to turn there. Matthew chapter 28. <clears throat> Actually, 18, and 19, 18 through 20. But let's, let's read this together. Who would like to read Matthew 28, verse 18? Thank you. Then Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All right, so this is a big deal. All authority, all power, all jurisdiction has been given to me. Jesus is talking about himself in heaven and on earth. And this is after he rose from the dead, just to be clear, okay? This is when he's talking to his 11 disciples, about to give the Great Commission, about to tell them how to make disciples, but he says all, everything in the universe, all authority, all jurisdiction over everything has been given to me, you see? And it's like, okay, cool, I get it. Jesus Christ has all authority. Jesus is God, if we understand that, great. But what does it have to do with this book that has been tampered with and I'm, I'm, talk, I'm, standing, I'm talking from the, the standpoint of devil's advocate. People say, it's been changed, it's been manipulated, right? Men have messed with it too much. Well, no, not necessarily. Actually, not at all. That's not true. We have enough proof that it's been sustained all these years. But let's get to the point, all right? Let's talk about the scripture itself. Let's go to John chapter 1, verse 1. And if someone would like to read that, John chapter 1, verse 1. All right, thank you. So, what is the word according to this verse? Who is the word according to this verse? That's right, it's Jesus. And if, if, if that's not crystal clear enough, if you go to drop down to verse 14, could you read verse 14 too? Thanks. And the word All right, is that clear that that's talking about Jesus? 
that the word manifests itself into, it, it became flesh and dwelt among us and showed its glory to everybody. Jesus, the person, the man, in the three years of ministry, that's absolutely clear now, huh? If that's not clear enough, let's go to Revelation chapter 19, verse 13, and see what Jesus calls himself. Keep in mind in Revelation, Jesus is judge, right? He came as Savior, but he returns as judge. And depending on what translation you're using, the heading of that paragraph, it's talking about Jesus on a white horse, right? But let's just read Re Revelation chapter 19, verse 13. Who would like to read that? He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. All right. Is that clear enough that Jesus himself is the Word? You see? See, if you put the puzzle, pieces of the puzzle together, if Jesus has all authority, all jurisdiction in heaven and on earth, and Jesus makes it abundantly clear that he himself is the word of God, then that tells us what has all authority and jurisdiction over the he in heaven and earth. What tells us? I mean, what does it tell us? It tells us that this book has all authority and jurisdiction over everything. Crazy, right? But awesome. <laughs> All right, so notice at the bottom I put this note, if this is true, how we treat Jesus, how we treat the Word is how we treat Jesus, our God, our Lord, Jesus as the person, Jesus as part of the Godhead, the personal relationship that we claim to have, or maybe we don't have it, because that determines how we treat His Word, you see? I mean, His Word, the way, the way we treat His Word determines our relationship with Him. All right, but you know how many... You may have heard so many times, I know Jesus, I have a relationship with Jesus, me and Jesus have an understanding, I feel this, I feel that, right? We hear that a lot. God told me this. Have you heard that a lot? God told me today that this and this and this is going to happen, or God told me to do this. God told me to cook this, right? God told two of you to make spaghetti today, right? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> But that doesn't prove you have a relationship with Jesus. What proves is how you respond to his word. What proves that you have a relationship is how you respond to his word. Jesus the person, Jesus the word. Let's go to Matthew chapter 8. And let's look at the faith of the centurion. A familiar story. But look at it through the lens as if, oh, is this how I treat the scriptures? Is this how I treat the Bible? So actually, let's, let's start in verse 5. I was going to connect these two stories together, but let's just look at verse 5, all right? So who would like to read verses 5 through 8, and we'll split it up, and then someone else can read verses 9 through 11. So 5 through 8, Matthew 8, or 8, 5 through 8. Thank you. All right, so this is interesting because right after this happens, Jesus is like, wow, this is amazing. Look at the faith of this person. And it's because something that he said and something that he understood right here in the last verse that was read in verse 9. Right? He said, I too am a man under authority and understand authority. And then Jesus says, oh man, such great faith I haven't even found in Israel. But we'll let somebody read that. Who would like to read the rest of it? Verses 10 and 11. Thank you.
All right, so you see how he says he recognizes the great faith because this guy understood authority. And according to what the centurion said, he said, I too am a man under authority, but I am too, too a man that has authority over people, has authority over my soldiers. Centurion, right? Over up to a thousand, around a thousand soldiers, right? That's what they were, had authority over. So how does that work? When the centurion says, go, what happens? What do the guys do under his authority? They do, it's as simple as that. Come. He says, come. What do they do? Come. Yeah, that's right. And then so we, we think of the scriptures when Jesus says, do or do not. Live this way. Don't live this way. You see? Are we responding to Jesus the same way that any person under the centurion would respond? Because that's how we know that Jesus recognizes, oh, you have faith in me, you see? That's another thing, I have faith, I believe, right? And James 2 clarifies that faith is dead without works. By the way, if we have time, maybe we won't. When we talk about that word belief in Greek, pistuo, it means to commit. Did you know that? It means to commit. When you look at John 3, 16, whosoever believeth in him, in him should not perish but have everlasting life, it's actually whosoever committeth, it should say committeth, whoever commits to me, not just believes that he exists. James 2.19 says that's demonic faith. Even the demons believe and they tremble. And he, many people say they believe in God or actually do believe in God. But when the rubber hits the road, it's the commitment. It's the level of the commitment that Jesus recognizes. And that connects to this authority that we're talking about right now. How we respond to him his scriptures, and him directly, it's the same thing. All right, any questions or comments so far? So yeah, I, to be honest with you, I usually don't use slides. I usually just put straight scripture on here, like the actual Bible, and we scroll, and everybody reads it together, but oh well. <laughs> Hopefully the slides are helpful, I don't know. All right. So I've been talking about this in different ways, but let's go to John chapter 14. And we're going to start in verse 15. How far do you want to go? Uh, so I'm just going to start with, well, like a couple verses. I'll pick out the verses. So we would like to read verse 15 in John chapter 14. Oh, go ahead. If you love me, keep my commandments. All right, cool. So mine says, New King James says the same thing. Does anybody have ESV or New American Standard? Does it say a little bit different? There's a one word difference, I think. Will, see? And I like the ESV translation because if you love me, you will keep my commandments. See the difference? If you love me, keep my commandments. That's New King James, King James. Prove it to me, right? But ESV words it differently as a promise. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You see? That actually makes a lot of sense. You know why? Because that's how all relationships work. If you love me, you will show me through action. You see? If you love me, you will show me through commitment. Anybody could say I love you. But automatically, if I love my children, I'm going to show them every single day. You see? It'll be second nature if I, if I truly love them. I won't have to force myself to, okay, you want water? Here, there's your water, you know? <laughs> it's like, no, I, I give them everything I possibly can, pour into them love and everything, right? It just happens. It just happens naturally. In a marriage relationship, it's like, it's not about me, it's about my spouse and your wish is my command because I, I love you so much. You see? It naturally happens. And that's why I like the ESV translation, rendering it as a promise. But with that being said, let's, let's go down to verse 21 and let's connect all these different promises of if you love me. So let's read verse 21. Who would like to read that? He who has my commandment and keeps them, 
is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him. And I will disclose myself to him. All right, isn't that amazing? So first of all, okay, he repeats himself. If you love me, you're going to automatically keep my commandments. And now he's saying, if you keep my commandments, you'll be loved by me. This is the condition, see? It's not, prove, it's not work your way to heaven, prove your... It's not about that. It's, this is how relationships work. They're reciprocal, you see? It's a two-way street. It, it's always been that way. Yeah, God is always going to love us. John 3, 16, he died for us before we even became Christian, right? He's always going to love us. But let's not mistake that for forgiveness. Let's not mistake that for relationship, okay? Christians have relationship with Jesus. Christians are forgiven, but not everybody. And just because God loves everybody and wishes for no one to perish, but all to come to repentance, that doesn't mean they're automatically forgiven or have a relationship. If you want a relationship with Jesus, you really need to heed his word, heed his commandments, and they're not, they're not rules to make us miserable. They're for our own good. They're guardrails for our own good. They're commandments that glorify God. It's not about us. It's all for his glory. Right? Ephesians chapter, was it? Ephesians chapter 3 verse 21. To him be the glory in the church forever and ever. To all generations. The church is here for his glory. It's not about us. It's never been about us. It's always been about him. And so he recognizes that when we surrender as his children, and as a good father, he looks down and says, you know what, this guy really does love me. He really does want to glorify me. You see? But at the, look at the end of verse 21. And will manifest or disclose myself to him. See that? What does that mean? If you think of it on a, on a human level, my children... <laughs> Right? They're not here now. I'm sorry. I know you guys made two tons of spaghetti for my children. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but let's say, like, okay, little Michael. Little Michael go, right? And he wants to talk to me. It's like, okay, I could choose to, not right now, I'm busy, or I can kneel down to him and talk to him. Okay, what's up, Michael? What do you need? You know? And that's disclosure, you see. It's because he's seeking me. He's seeking me as a father. He's seeking fatherly love. And I'm like, I'm going to give him my disclosure. I'm going to give him my attention. You see? You see what's going on here? You guys know the scriptures well enough. What does God say if you're actually rebelling against him? Does he actually hear our prayers? We're going to look at that this morning. No. He refuses to hear our prayers. He refuses to look at us if we're in rebellion to him. Isaiah chapter 1. We're going to look at that this morning. All right? Did you raise your hand? Somebody raise your hand? Okay. All right, let's see. So check this out. Let's read verse 24 now. Let's look at the opposite. We, look at, we see the promise that he's going to reveal himself to us. But then he identifies, okay, if you don't care about my word, you're treating Jesus like you don't love him. And I'm going to clarify that. Verse 24. Who would like to read verse 24? He who does not love me does not keep my word. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Alright, you see that? He who does not love me does not keep my words. Does not keep my commandments. And just to be clear, to be fair and completely brutally honest of that word keep, it means guard. Okay? Don't mistake it for perfect obedience. Okay? None of us can maintain perfect obedience. Nobody, none of us can keep the rules all day, every day. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have to die on the cross for us. Galatians 3 talks about that. No man can keep, live by the law. It's impossible. Jesus died for all of our sins before we came to Christ, while we came to Christ, and after we came to Christ. And don't misunderstand me. That doesn't give us a license to sin like Jude talks about. Do not misunderstand me at all. Romans 6 talks about that. Shall we continue to see that grace may abound? God forbid. No, that's not what we're talking about. But we do need to understand that we cannot save ourselves, and there's no such a thing as humans with perfect obedience. But there are humans that are supposed to constantly confess 
1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Constantly confess to the Father, and he's going to cleanse us of all of, un all of Jesus, all cleanses of all unrighteousness if we constantly confess to him our sins. You see? And not just uh, do things on purpose. Oh, I'm going to steal this bike and then confess later, right? <laughs> not, not, not like that. It's actually penitent, right? Broken and contrite hearts, confessing and transforming every single day into the image of Jesus. That's the relationship that we should have. All right, so I have questions up here. Do I have a personal relationship with Jesus? God, I ha have an understanding. I already asked these questions. The Spirit told me this. I talked about this in the beginning of the class. All right. All right, so let's address the I think stuff, okay? This was fresh on my mind because I studied it with a new brother in a coffee shop because he was questioning why well, I heard this and I heard that and I heard this on YouTube talk about the end times. We're not going to talk about end times right now, right? But just letting you know, that's a waste of time. When people try to talk about end times, pre-mail, all that stuff from Revelation, people try to go to Revelation first, even though they don't understand Daniel. You see, it's a huge waste of time, you know, for everybody. We should be out there talking about the essentials, talking about salvation, not arguing about revelation. But regardless, look at what happens when we argue about these things and what Paul says. So 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. We'll start in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. 3 and 4. Who would like to read that? Go ahead. All right, so see how Paul is urging, urging Timothy, and he's urging us, if we apply it, as Christians, to just stay away from ridiculous lies and made up, made up things by man. Opinions, essentially, you see. He calls it in verse 4, fables, some translators say myths, endless genealogies, causes disputes. The church is supposed to build each other up and build other people up. You see? We're supposed to be loving. The goal is love. Not arguing about nonsense. Not arguing about opinions. Verse 5 clarifies the purpose of the commandment of the Lord. Who would like to read verse 5? Thank you. All right. That's beautiful, isn't it? Look at what it says. The whole purpose is love from a pure heart, not just love, not fake love. And there's all, obviously there's different loves in Greek, but we're not going to get into that right now. Good conscience, sincere faith. So pure-hearted love, a good conscience. What's, what's a good conscience? What is, that, what is he talking about? If you're going to simplify it, What's a good conscience? Yeah, do, doing what God's word said is, is the result of the good conscience, absolutely. But before you actually start, before you, before you act, what's the good conscience? It's, it's having a rightly trained conscience. It's, it's you know, making sure that you know, what, you do, like what you do is, is well, like Betty said, based on the word, but, mm -hmm. but it's, it's having your conscience rightly trained. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Any other thoughts? Second position added to that, you train the conscience first, and then you live in accordance with it. Yeah. That's the good conscience. You live in accordance with what's your conscience. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. And I can think it all starts in your childhood when your parents or the adults who are around you teach you the difference between good So here's, here's a different level to consider. These are all excellent, especially for the Christian. But a different level to consider. What about people that aren't Christian? 
What about people that don't even believe in the Bible, right? So let me tell you a little bit of background. I, I'm not sure if, this would, if, if that's okay in the class right now. A little bit of background about myself in the class. Is that right? All right. So actually, I, I came from atheism before I became a Christian, all right? Before I met Heather, I was an atheist. I did have a conscience, but it wasn't the conscience of, it wasn't the mind of Christ, like Paul talks about. But I did know that if I stole something or lied, I felt bad, you see? It's all, that's ingrained in us. Humans are designed that way. That makes us different than other creatures because we have that conscience. If we take cuts in line, right, we should feel guilty, even if we're a Christian or not. I mean, you see people complain all the time on Facebook, how dare that person, how dare he, or how dare she, and they're, they're atheists, right? But they're talking about morality, you see? So there's that level of morality that Romans 1 talks about, that everybody knows that there's a God, but they suppress him. But then there's the good conscience that Christians are supposed to have, as opposed to the, you know what 1 Timothy chapter 4 talks about? A seared conscience, you see? And that's kind of what I was getting at. These are all great answers, and they're all right. But a seared conscience, seared like with a hot iron, like on your brain, <laughs> I guess, or nerves. What happens when your nerves are burnt up? What happens? That's right, no feeling. Nothing, right? You can sit all day and not feel anything. You can rebel against God and not feel anything. That's a seared conscience. That's a conscience that doesn't work. A good conscience is exactly what all you guys described but it's functioning correctly according to Scripture, according to God's will, you see? That's a good conscience. All right, so let's keep reading. Uh, verses, let's read verse 7. So check this out. This happens all the time, doesn't it? Let's read verse 7. Whoever would like to read. Go ahead. All right, so this happens a lot, doesn't it? We see lots of preachers, famous preachers, not famous preachers, people in public all the time. They confidently talk about things that they have no understanding of, that cannot be proven with Scripture. You see, this happens all the time. The most dangerous is how, how to be saved. That's abused and misused all the time. But other things, like tithe, right? Are, you guys give your tithe today? You're going to tithe today? Like, what are you talking about? You know, the Christian, Christians don't tithe. Christians give in a collection according to 1 Corinthians 16. There's no tithe. That's old law. You see, the people boldly talk about these things and not even know, they don't know what they're talking about. Oh, let's, uh, yeah, we're going to have this uh, youth pastor and we're going to have a bunch of people playing all these instruments doing this rock concert, glorifying God, you know. Super enthusiastic, super pumped up, claiming that it's from God's word, but it's not in there at all. This happens all the time. And that's why we've got to be super careful, right? So let's go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, chapter 6, verse 3. We're not going over all of them, but we're just going over, we're t it's like a helicopter ride over the things that Paul is saying. Uh, th let's read three and four, thank you. If anyone speaks otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with God godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which Envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions. Andrew's five. I apologize. I should put that on there. <laughs> That's my bed. All right. So look at how Paul put it. It's like. Okay, you, you have a, this conversation with somebody that's teaching something that's not scriptural. And it's like, okay, they're, maybe they're just a little off, right? And that's okay. Maybe they just don't know. And that's fine. But let me give you an example. I studied with a, a youth, youth pastor from Calvary Chapel years ago about eldership. 
about pastors. What is actually a pastor? So I went through all of that with him. First Timothy chapter 3, the qualifications. Titus chapter 1, the qualifications, right? So I went over the qualifications with him. You know what his response was? He said, those are just suggestions, right? Those aren't really qualifications. Those are just suggestions of what a pastor should be, you see? So it's like, okay, fine. Given the benefit of the doubt, when you study with them, maybe they just don't know. That's fine. But when they stand there, sit there, and say, nah, I disagree with God's word, even though it's crystal clear, you see? That's what Paul's talking about right here, you see? Destitute of mind, you see? <clears throat> All right, finally, verse 20. Verse 20, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> what are we supposed to do What's our, as Christians? Oh, sorry, 620? Oh. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. No, you're good. <laughs> like, whoa. <laughs> New glasses. Oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and vain babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. All right, so there you go. Avoid it. Avoid all opinions. Second Timothy 3, 16, real quick. You guys know this. And 17. The way that Hugh taught me this years ago, he drew a box on a piece of paper, and then he wrote this in the box. Anything outside this box, no, right? It needs to be in that box. Reject anything outside this box. So we would like to read verses 16, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. See that? I put on here, no opinions, no myths, no conspiracies, no heresies. It's, it's not in there. It's not in the scriptures. But stuff outside the scriptures, when we try to bring it in, that's when all this stuff happens that Paul's warning us about. You see? All right, how much time do we have? About ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay. All right, so any comments or questions about what we just discussed? Oh, absolutely. Taking scripture out of context like Satan did in Matthew chapter 4, right? You try to use Psalm 91 and say what it really didn't mean. And we'll talk about that. Too. We're kind of going to hit on that when we look at this. So I want you guys to consider this, okay? Scripture. Again, during our, our age and time, our time and age or era, the common thing is, God said this to me, I feel this and I feel that. The Spirit told me this. It's so super duper common right now, at least where, we are, where we're from. We have these conversations all the time in Tucson with people. But I want us to consider this. It is written. All right? So first of all, remember in Exodus? So, finger of God, right? The Egyptians recognize, oh, it's the finger of God that is producing all this power and these wonders and signs, right? Everybody, everybody saw that. So later it's revealed in Exodus 31 that the finger of God wrote the law, the old law, the law of Moses. Isn't that interesting? Did he have to do that? Did God have to write down a law for mankind physically? He didn't have to do that, but he chose to do that. I'm glad he did. Because this goes back to the beginning of our conversation. Anybody can say, I think. Anybody can say, I feel. Anybody can say, God told me. But if it's written down for all men to compare and prove, it's irrefutable. You see? That's so beautiful. I love that. The finger of God wrote it. And then when you look at it is written, it's 61 times in the New Testament. It is written. You see? The apostles, Jesus himself, they always appealed to scriptural authority. They always appealed back to the written word, the written law. They didn't just say, I think, I feel, you see? So let's go to Matthew chapter 4 real quick. We have ten, like, probably less than 10 minutes now. Matthew 
And I know that, that Satan abused it. I know that, I, I get that, but I just want us to look at how Jesus responded. We're just going to look at the verses for the sake of time. So Jesus is being sent him out. Satan is trying to accuse him, trying to get him to sin. And Jesus has three responses to Jesus or to Satan's three accusations or temptations. So let's read verse four. Matthew four four. Who'd like to read that? Thanks. All right, I love this. All right, we, we, we go to Deuteronomy 6 and 8 where Jesus quotes. I usually like to do that, but we don't have time right now just to look at the big picture of what's going on there when they're in the wilderness and how God tells them that he humbled them to test them in the wilderness all these years, that he let them go hungry and their clothes didn't wear out to test them. I love talking about that because that's the Christian, that's the Christian life, right? We're here, essentially life is a test. It's, it's a test of faith, but it's also the purpose of life is to worship God. Number one. And number two, what's the second greatest commandment? That's right. That's right. Love God, love your neighbor. Life is all about relationships. You see? It's not about stuff. It's not about status. It's about relationships. Relationship with God, relationship with other people. So anyways, all right. Look at verse 7. Look how Jesus responds a second time. In verse 7. Who would like to read verse 7 in Matthew chapter 4? Jesus said, it is written again, you shall not kill the Lord your God. Ah, ran out of time. But you see my point? Oh, five point? Okay. You see, not my point. You see the scripture's point? And then Apostle Paul says the same thing. It is written. Romans 1, 17, 2, 24, 3, 4, 3, 10. That's not it. I only chose a couple of them. It's all over the place. But my point is this. Do we think that we're better than Jesus? Do we think that we're better than the apostles? Because they said it is written when they try to prove a point. You see? And that's exactly what we need to do. Show me the scripture. You see, that's the old radio show that I used to be on. <laughs> show me the scripture. That's how you prove what is true. And in context, obviously. Because it could be taken out of context. Prove to me the context. All right, so any, any, more, any other thoughts or questions? And I, I think, you know, just to go along with that, and this is one of the things that I've learned from you since you've been here, is that, you know, a lot of times it, it, it helps so much, I think, to let them read it for themselves. Instead of, you know, us quoting scripture to them, um, and, and, of course, being, then being accused of, well, that's just your opinion, mm -hmm. That's right. They can, they can either take it or leave it. But it's not that, hey, this is my opinion to go along with your opinion. This is, this is what's written. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, yeah. So it, it's, uh, it's, I, I just have found that that, is, that has helped me in the way I approach people now, too, because instead of you know, trying to beat somebody over the head with it, Exactly. So I also learned that from you years ago, and I've also applied that. Anybody that I study with, that I evangelize to, in public places or whatever, I have them read it, if they're willing. Most, most are. The last guy that we studied with, he's a Catholic, and I showed him Mark 16, 16. I said, what's this say? And he read it, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. I was like, okay. So tell me how to be saved according to that verse. He said, well, you've got to believe. And I wrote it down, believe first. He said, yes, that's what it says. And then he said, and I said, what's next? He said, baptize. I'm like, okay. Second? He said, yeah, that's what it says. And then what's after? What's, what comes last? Oh, saved. And I said, third. I said, believe first, baptize second, save third. Is that what it says? He said, yeah, that's what it says. I'm like, okay. So I said, and then I went to Acts 22, 16 and said, what are you waiting for? <laughs> it was a huge study. It, was, it wasn't just that verse. 
And he said, no, I need to think about this. Let me get back to you. I'll let you know when I'm ready. So we haven't heard from him yet, but we'll see him when we get back. So, But anyways, yeah, exactly. There's no way out of it if they read it themselves and they actually use, you know, logic. Logos, the word, that's, it's connected to logic, right? Anyways, it's undeniable, right? All right, so how much time do I have now? One minute, okay, let's see what, yeah. And I already talked about this, okay. So who would like to read 2 Corinthians 1, 13? And then someone else could read Ephesians 3, 4, back to back. Thank you. Oh, no, it's okay. By which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. All right, so these are two simple, quick examples of how the scripture is designed for man, mankind to understand. You see? And God chose to use a written language to express himself to us. Why he did that? I don't know exactly why I don't have the mind of God exactly. But I can tell you that I'm glad he did. And I give you the reasons before. I'm glad he did because it's like, this is what it says. I don't care what we, I think or you think or what I feel, see? So, yeah. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And yeah, see you again <laughs> soon. <laughs>